Hi, and welcome to this guide for the Bible study from Gather Magazine for December 2020. I'm Dave Thomas, lead pastor of Cross of Christ Lutheran Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington. And I welcome all Welka Circle leaders and members and any and all who are joining us for this Bible study of the text for this month's devotional labeled Singing, Writing, Moving, and Connecting Advent Rituals for Uncertain Times from Gather Magazine. Well, these certainly are uncertain times, aren't they? And I'm uncertain about how you're planning on using this guide, whether you're going to be doing a virtual circle gathering, maybe you're hosting or facilitating that conversation via Zoom or some other platform, or maybe this is your December Welka Bible study experience. In any case, I'm glad that you've joined me as we look at the Bible text referenced in this month's magazine, all of them from the first chapter of Luke. And while they're not offered exactly in order in the devotion, we'll read them that way as they come to us in Scripture, beginning in verse 25 through verse 45. I'll be using the New Revised Standard Version, the English translation we most often use here at Cross of Christ for our Bible studies and in our traditional worship services. And like I said, while I'm going to go through these verses in order, I'll note for you the various sections of the devotion uh, that they're attached to by our author, who is the Reverend Jordan Miller Steubendick, who is an ELCA pastor from Niagara Falls, New York. Before we begin, I'd invite you to make sure you have your note-taking supplies, your Bible, and of course, your copy of the December Gather magazine. And we're going to turn in our devotion. It begins on page 20, but we're going to look first at page 21, the first column, the second full paragraph. It starts, it can be helpful. And that's where uh, Pastor Jordan notes for us uh, this word liminal. Liminal means a transition time, a process, a space that is uh, an intermittent um, state or phase or condition. And as she notes, it comes from the Latin word meaning threshold. A liminal time or experience is like a threshold that leads from one room to another, one space to another. And Pastor Jordan goes on to note that Advent is a liminal time, and that's true. Uh, the church year begins with the first Sunday in Advent. It's a, a change from one church year to the next. Advent's also, you know, more than a season before another season. It's not just the waiting time before Christmas, but it is also that, and it is that sort of liminal space, the time before Christmas. Uh, she also recognizes for us that we are living in a liminal time, this experience of uh, thrust upon us by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's especially true as I record this. We are in a liminal time when on one hand, the pandemic has never been worse. More people are testing positive, experiencing symptoms, being hospitalized, needing intensive care, and dying these days, this day, than at any other point in the pandemic. And so more than ever, we have to recommit ourselves to doing all we can even though it's understandable that we are weary of doing all these things, of mask wearing and social distancing, of being disappointed by having to cancel holiday events, and family gatherings, maybe trips to visit loved ones. We're feeling the loss also of gathering in person, which we will not be able to do for Advent, or Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, for worship together. This is a, a difficult time. It is a, a dark time but it is a very consequential time in the epidemic. And yet even as that is all true, we are welcoming the great news of the development of what appears to be very safe, very effective, and very near to being ready vaccines, which promise to curb the growing tide and within the next several months or so, we pray, to get this rampant killer virus under control. We're not there yet. We're we're nearing there, but we're not nearly there. We're almost on the doorstep. We're at the threshold, as it were. We are in a liminal time. Pastor Jordan doesn't point this out, but I'm sure she's aware of it. I'm confident that she is, that as Christians, we are always living liminally. We are in what is sometimes called a time between time or a, a an already but not yet time. That is, we live in that time after the first advent of Christ, his birth, but prior to his second advent, his promised return. Uh, 
And so this already but not yet liminal time is like a, a threshold experience to which our attention is brought every Advent season, but maybe this Advent season more than ever we are aware of it. So with this as part of our background, let's now look at the passages before us. As I said, they're all from Luke 1, and we start at verse 26. Very familiar words, which we will hear this time of year. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged or betrothed, as older English Bibles like the King James put it. It's from a root meaning to give a, a souvenir or a keepsake. Um, Think of it akin to the giving of a ring for engagement. Betrothal was a formal step towards marriage, and there were the exchange of, of things between families or between uh, those who are making their way towards marriage. It was a sort of a, a locking in of the relationship, and it had legal status as well. So back to the reading. Gabriel comes to this virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, in Hebrew, Yusuf, which means he will add of the house of David. So a couple more notes here. First about a Gabriel, whose name means God is strong or God is my strong man or God's strong man. Gabriel can be described as God's strong man or be described as a name meaning God's strong man. Now from Hebrew, names that end in El, E-L, reference El or Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God. So all those names are about God. For example, Daniel. God is my judge. Joel, Yahweh is God. Israel, God is upright. Michael, who is like God. Gabriel is also often described as being an archangel, although the Bible doesn't give him that title. Gabriel does serve God in a very high way. Gabriel appears to be um, the principal messenger or emissary that God often sends to humans. Gabriel appeared, uh, for example, to the prophet Daniel uh, to explain his dreams. And in the nativity account, in addition to this encounter with Mary, Gabriel appears to Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, the father of John, who will become known as John the Baptist. Also, not in the Bible, though commonly believed or um, held, is the image of Gabriel's horn or trump or trumpet. Uh, now, a horn or a trumpet, uh, the blowing of such, is associated with eschatological events in the Bible, end times stuff, the, the great day of the return of the Lord. But in none of those verses is it indicated that Gabriel will be sounding the blast. In spite of some really cool art and music, uh, spirituals, poetry, to the contrary, so the second note I wanted to make here is uh, pointing out that Joseph was of the house of David. That is, Joseph was a descendant of King David, which matters um, for the fulfillment of prophecy. But also, uh, as we hear later in the Christmas story, it explains why Joseph and uh, the by then uh, pregnant Mary head to Bethlehem from Nazareth for the census that's ordered by the Roman emperor, Augustus. So... Moving along, end of verse 27, we'll continue into verse 28. The virgin's name was Mary, and he, that is Gabriel, came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. Uh, what we have in English as favored one is from a single Greek compound word, meaning favored by grace, or favored with grace, or graced by God, or gifted by God. As a particular sense, uh, favored, uh, meaning uh, graced or gifted by God. Greetings, favored one, favored of the Lord. The Lord is with you. But Mary was much perplexed by these words. Now, perplexed in uh, English makes it sound like Mary was confused, which is part of the Greek root, but it also means to be uh, troubled or, or agitated. Um, not so much uh, upset, angry, as uh, disturbed or taken aback. So it's an experience of, of confusion, but also of, of, of being taken aback, being st stirred up. Um, not understanding things. And Mary pondered what sort of greeting this might be. I assume uh, that she was specifically wondering why she, a young woman, unmarried, of no particular status or standing in her culture, would be called favored by God by anyone, much less an angel. Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, 
Do not be agitated or upset. For you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb. And yes, ladies, it literally says that in Greek. In your womb, you will conceive. Which seems to me an unnecessary added detail, because where else would a woman conceive? Anyway, back to the text. Gabriel goes on saying, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. Now, I have to take a little sidetrack here by something that I think is um, important to know. In Matthew's gospel, we get um, a further detail. And that is that an angel, now Matthew doesn't name that angel. It might well have been Gabriel. It sounds a lot like Gabriel, but uh, we can't say for certain because Matthew doesn't tell the name of the angel. But an angel comes to Joseph who was just himself perplexed because he had just found out that his betrothed was pregnant. And he knew for sure that he wasn't the father since he hadn't yet um, known Mary, as old timey Bibles put it. But Mary was claiming to, to uh, Joseph that she was unknown by anyone, that she was still a virgin. So while Joseph was processing all of this and considering what to do, uh, breaking off the betrothal as quietly and quickly as he could to not bring any unnecessary or extra public shame to Mary. Uh, an angel appears to him, and as recorded in Matthew one twenty, says, sort of echoing what Gabriel says to Mary in our passage, Joseph, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary into your home as your wife. And then goes on to explain the Holy Spirit nature of her pregnancy. And then in verse 21 says, And you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, when we hear that, we probably think, that's right, Jesus will be the Savior. That makes sense. Great name. But a Hebrew or Aramaic speaker would have understood this on a deeper level, and that's what I want to share with you. Now, Aramaic uh, was the language of the Jewish people of the time of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. It had a deep uh, Hebraic roots. Aramaic belongs to the Northwest Semitic group of the Afro-Asiatic language family, which includes Canaanite languages, including Hebrew, Moabite, Phoenician, Amorite, and uh, Ugaritic. You can trust me because I looked it up. You can actually trust me because I looked it up on a very reliable um, resource that I use all the time. Now, Aramaic was um, the first language of Jesus. It would have been his cradle language. Uh, that's the language of the Jews, as I said, living in that time. And they would have learned to, uh, to uh, speak and, and, uh, in Aramaic first. But then they would have also learned other languages. They would have learned the uh, lingua franca, the, the, the language of trade and commerce in the public square of that time, a uh, very multicultural time in the Roman Empire. And that was Greek or Koine Greek, uh, sometimes called biblical Greek, it wasn't called that then, but the, the form of Greek that existed at that time. In addition, Jewish children, particularly Jewish boys, would have also studied Hebrew as far as they would have been allowed by both their, their um, ability, but also their status, because they, they poor Jewish boys didn't have the same access. Uh, but they would have all learned at least enough Hebrew to understand it as a liturgical or worship language. J Jesus clearly could read Hebrew. He demonstrates that um, in um, uh, multiple times in, in the temple. Anyway, why do I bring all of this up, aside from the fact that I find it fascinating? Well, it has to do with this naming of this child conceived by Mary, in her womb, through the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is how we English speakers pronounce this name. In Aramaic, the name is Yesu or Yesus, or a version of it is Yeshua. And um, the name itself in Aramaic is a derivative of Hebrew, as Aramaic is connected to Hebrew. The Hebrew name Yoshua or Yoshua, or as we pronounce it, Joshua. And that name is a compound word. Second part means to deliver or rescue or save. And the first, the Y-O or Y-A, um, is a reference to the personal name of God, Yahweh. Just like L in like Daniel or Gabriel is a reference to Elohim. Thus, Joshua or Yoshua or Yeshua, or Yesu, or Jesus, or Jesus, or any form of that name literally means 
Yahweh delivers. So Joseph was told, you shall name him Yahweh delivers, for he will save his people from their sins. Makes sense. Maybe opens up the name of Jesus a little bit more for us. Very cool, right? But wait, there's even more. Gabriel goes on to say to Mary, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now I have to pause here and tell you that this text isn't just the center for our December 2020 Gather Devotion, but it is also the gospel text for the fourth Sunday in Advent this year, which is December 20th. So I'm going to save some of what I'm learning about this text in my research for the sermon in a couple of weeks. But for now, let's listen as Mary and Gabriel um, conversation goes on. This is verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Which seems a very fair question. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, like I said, I'll explore this part of the passage more in the upcoming sermon. But for now, we have to set back and marvel at the faith of young Mary who though perplexed and pondering what all of this meant, who had legit questions and who got an answer from the angel, which was really something like, you know, it's a divine mystery, Mary. You just have to trust God. To all of this, Mary says, okay. Okay, if this is the Lord's will, then I am ready to serve. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. So this portion of Luke 1 is covered in the devotional on page 24 and 25, in which Pastor Jordan considers the conversation and connection and camaraderie that young Mary will soon share with her much more senior cousin Elizabeth, both miraculously pregnant as nothing is impossible with God. Next, our study author sends us to verse 39, which is a very straightforward telling of that uh, visit from Mary to Elizabeth. Uh, the journey anyway. I'm going to also include verse 40, which for some reason is left out of the devotion, but we need for the details. So this is Luke 1, 39 to 40. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, this is sometimes referenced as the visitation with a capital V. It is um, remembered. It has its own feast day of the same name, the Feast of the Visitation, it is on May 31st. So this verse, and Luke is the only one to describe the visit of Mary to Elizabeth, this verse doesn't give us all the details some of us would like to know. Like, which Judean town exactly? I have no idea why it's not named by Luke. Luke is a physician. He is usually very precise and detailed, um, like a physician might be in the telling of his gospel, but he doesn't tell us which Judean town. Scholars over the years have taken several educated guests, guesses, um, and we have some information. It's uh, described as being in the hill country. Uh, so one of the candidates most often put forth uh, is uh, Hebron. Hebron is uh, south of Jerusalem, about 20 miles. It's in the Judean mountains. It is in what we today call the West Bank of the Palestine Territory. Uh, Hebron is about 80 miles from Nazareth as the crow flies. But Mary wasn't a crow, so she couldn't fly there. She would have had a journey on foot, and given the route and the terrain, uh, the path from Nazareth all the way to Hebron is closer to about 100 miles, uh, given the routes that would have been available to Mary in her day. And that's a pretty long trip. Uh, pretty impressive. Now, Mary was still very early in her pregnancy, and she was still a young woman, and uh, that wouldn't have been entirely uncommon. It would have taken her several days to journey, uh, but she makes her way to visit Elizabeth, who, uh, by the time she gets there, is six months along herself. And we're told in verse 56 of Luke 1, which just comes 
right after the devotional texts end, that Mary stays three months with Elizabeth and Zechariah. And while we're not given this information, again, more things we uh, might like to know, but apparently God and the gospel writers didn't think we needed to know, we, um, we can make a hunch. We can uh, wonder if Mary might not have stayed uh, for the birth of Elizabeth's son. She comes when Elizabeth's six months pregnant. She stays three months. She could have left just before, but perhaps she stayed until the birth of John uh, to help Elizabeth out, to share in the joy, uh, to greet the new baby, and perhaps to prepare herself for her own childbirthing to come. In the Gather uh, magazine, this section is covered beginning at the very bottom of page 22, column one, titled Move Your Body. And it's about the uh, sacredness of, uh, of physical movement, uh, this journey that Mary took being the, the launching off point for our author. Now, the next part of Luke 1, verse 41 to 45, is actually the first section of the devotion. It starts on page 21 where Pastor Jordan focuses on gratitude, along with um, a sense of wonder and joy as first expressed by Elizabeth in these verses. So this is verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. The Greek here is a root that means to leap or to bound or to skip or to frolic like a little lamb or a, a young goat, a kid. It can be translated leap for joy, which it will be in another verse or two. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Again, from the Greek, the root meaning behind blessed means to be well spoken of. It means to have an excellent reputation, to be well thought of. It's another compound word. It literally means to have good things said about you. And uh, so we continue from there, verse 43. Elizabeth says, and why should this happen to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? Now, that's quite a de declaration of faith by Elizabeth. Long before Simon Peter makes what will become called the great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that after spending nearly three years with Jesus, witnessing his preaching and teaching and miracles, Elizabeth says that the baby still forming inside Mary, this one is my Lord. Go on, verse 44. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. There we go. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Now, Elizabeth, this, this great woman of great faith, blessed herself to be giving birth to her first child, well past the age at which that would have normally occurred, makes note of Mary's faith, demonstrated by Mary's trusting of God's message to her. Finally, chronologically last, but covered in the second section of the devotion, which starts on page 23 and continues to the next page, are verses 46 to 55, which are very often called Mary's song, or the Magnificat. That's from the first word in Latin of the translation of these verses. Uh, Magnificat, I, or actually literally it, that is Mary's soul, magnifies. Magnificat. I magnify, it magnifies. For some of us Lutherans, though, we can't help but hear the lovely melody and words of songwriter Marty Haugen's rendition of the Magnificat whenever we hear these verses uh, from the beloved Holded Evening Prayer worship setting. So if that's what's going on in your head as we hear this together, you're not alone. Let's listen to the Magnificat together. This is verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant, Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. In mercy for those who fear him from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. In Greek, magnify is megalene. It's a compound word, megalene. You know the first part, mega. Mega is something big, really big. And the second part means to make. So magnify literally means to make something big. 
but we don't actually make God big, right? So that can't mean what magnify means. God is already, you know, mega big. To magnify in this sense means to point out or proclaim or to show God's greatness. In a way, it's like a magnifying glass reveals something, makes it easier to see. So to magnify the Lord, to praise God, is to worship the one who saves, to draw attention to how great God is and all of the great things that God does, like being merciful and scattering the proud and lifting up the lowly and filling the hungry and keeping promises, as Mary sings or says in these verses. Speaking of singing, our devotion writer, Pastor Jordan, talks about songs, specifically Advent songs, in this section. She asks, what is our favorite or, or what Advent songs are you thankful for? And I guess, you know, if you were starting a list, you'd start with maybe O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And then there's, there's plenty of other really lovely Advent songs. This year, in addition to our Sunday recorded worship, we're sharing midweek Advent recordings, little reflections that are beautified and based on the song, Here I Am to Worship, which I never thought of before as an Advent piece of music, but I do now. Ben, our Director of Worship and Music Ministry, selected this song for the Midweek Advent Reflections, arguing very persuasively that any song that speaks about the light of the world coming out into the darkness and the king of all days coming humbly to the world he created is very Advent-y indeed. And I think he's right. So as we wrap up this guide and our time together, I want to invite you, if you haven't already done so, to check out the first of these midweek reflections, which are um, going to be posted. The first one is already posted on the Cross of Christ YouTube channel. And look for two more to come in the next two Wednesdays in Advent, the second and third Wednesday in December. We'll send links by email to our members, but you can always find these and all of our recordings, our worship recordings, these Bible studies, our welcome recordings. Uh, all of our recordings are on our YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and search Cross of Christ Bellevue. Well, I certainly hope that... Um, as you search for guidance and preparation and maybe leading your welcome circles, facilitating a, an online discussion, or if this has been um, a source for faith growing for you, maybe even uh, a time of inspiration as we spend time in God's word. If this is your December welcome study, thanks for joining me. Until next time, the Lord bless you and keep you. So long.